Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's half-finished basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, happy holiday if you're in the USA and... Uh, happy Monday if you're someplace else. Either way, we've got a great show for you today. Please help us welcome executive producer of the new National Geographic series Year Million, Dave O'Connor. Plus, with headlines about hot stocks from Investopedia, David Siegel. We'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller, answer a question from the mailbag, and wash it all down with a swig of my amazing trivia. And now, here they are, Two guys taking a break from lawn darts, Joe and O J J J J G. I always love it when you decide you want to record right as I'm winning. I like the old school lawn darts. Do you have those? Absolutely. The poke your eye out lawn darts. Well, your mom wouldn't let us take those out. That's why I was asking if you have the real ones that we got the weighted, you know, beanbag ones they're, now. But they're horrible. You throw them straight up in the air and then you run away and see who gets impaled. <laughs> Mom, there's something in my leg. Hey, everybody, I'm Joe Salcihai, Ever Show Money on Twitter. And today is a holiday in the United States. And because it's a holiday, we have- It's an important holiday. We have OG with us. That's It's a holiday. So OG gets to be on this particular episode. Well, I'm on all these oh, episodes, yeah. but- Well, that is true. Good point. That, but it is a holiday. That it's means a Memorial Day. Every day's a holiday. Happy Memorial Day to you. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's happy, but- but uh, good so, Memorial Day. Uh, rem- remembrance. Yes, absolutely. And you know, one thing while we're remembering, people should remember to head to our sponsors. That's that's a horrible segue. Boy, that is, that, that just doesn't, that oh my, turned my stomach. Oh my goodness. Is that, oh, was that bad? In between your head to reflection stack. at uh, Arlington <laughs> National Cemetery, while you're on your way home. This reflection is brought to you by SoFi. That is, that is so, so humble. Now there's a special place for me in hell. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI because you know what you're going to find there, OG? You're going to find that your student loans, your personal loans are not at the great interest rate that they should be. They are the leader in marketplace lending with tons and tons of people using them all the time. Here's why. Because like our friend Dan Macklin at SoFi said, it only takes less than 20 minutes and you'll know exactly how they're going to work with you. And you have flexibility of terms, flexibility of repayment plans, stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. They'll throw in a hundred bucks if you use them for personal loans or for student loans. And if you're looking for a better way to invest, check out M1 Finance. They've completely rethought how online brokerages should work to make it enjoyable, convenient, and low cost. That's why I use M1 Finance. Personally, doesn't make it right for you, but uh, full disclosure, I use them specifically for that reason. So the way it works is you build an investment portfolio by specifying what percentage of your money you want to go into certain investments. And after just a couple minutes it takes to set everything up, you just then deposit your money. It's that simple, as easy as a savings account. M1 automates all the buying and selling to put your money into the portfolio with the correct allocation, even uses fractional shares so that every penny gets to work, and it intelligently adapts how it directs the money based on market movement. With M1, it's super simple to have your money always invested exactly the way you want. It's a no-brainer to check out for everybody invested. Your first $1,000 in the platform is free, and then they charge 0.25% for all balances up to 100000 or only 015 if you're over 100000 Do yourself a favor and check it out on the web at stackybenjamins.com forward slash M number one finance. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash M one finance or download their slick mobile app on iOS or Android M one finance be invested. We're getting invested in today's show. Dave O'Connor. Did you see the Tony Robbins special? Not your guru. I know you did. Cause we talked about it. Of course I did. I've watched it several times. Actually. He's the executive producer also of that. Mr. O'Connor's got some fantastic work. Glad that we get to talk to him today on the short wave. We're going to talk to him about the future. Cause this national geographic series, year million going to take a look into the far future and we're going to ask him about where money's headed 
in the in the far future. Caught an episode of that already. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. But we've got some awesome headlines, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline today comes to us from Investment News. Here's some news. Indexed variable annuity sales slump as the Department of Labor fiduciary rule looms. This is written by Greg Iacurci. Man, and I know, Greg, I slaughtered that. Uh, <laughs> uncertainty around the rule may be contributing to tentativeness from advisors and distribution. So the Department of Labor ruling is still up in the air, OG. And uh, scheduled to start in a week. So we're taking a look at this thing. And it turns out in the first quarter, first quarter numbers just came out, variable annuities, index annuities, advisors going, maybe maybe this thing that I used to be able to look people in the eye and say was absolutely perfect for your situation <laughs> may, might, might, might not have been. Well, you know, like we've said a thousand times, there's a time and a place for everything, but it doesn't solve every problem. And when you're a salesperson and everything you've got is a hammer, and everything looks like a nail, and all of a sudden uh, you can you can try to squeeze everything into that one particular solution that you have. But interestingly, when when the government regulations come down, and all of a sudden you've got a another set of eyes watching things, that ought to tell you what you need to know about the the vast majority of those sales. Now, it didn't say that the sales went to zero; it just says that it's yeah. gone down quite a bit. Well, and this is it funny. Says this, it slumped. Of but, the uh, two of these, which do you think is a product? that should be used less often, indexed or variable annuities? Of the two, which is more of a niche product? Uh, what's more of a niche product? Um, I guess I would say probably the index is more specific to uh, solving a specific thing. And, what do you say? Well, and I totally agree. I think oh, that there's phew, a, okay. I think, no. <laughs> a plus for OG. Well, because in a variable annuity, you have a bunch of different sub accounts that look and smell a lot like mutual funds for people out there that don't know what's inside of a variable annuity. So like your 401k plan will have a lot of different choices. A variable annuity will have a, sometimes now tons and tons of choices. Yeah. When I started the business, I remember a couple of the annuities that uh, that I would recommend had like one had like four choices and one had six. And now if they have less than 25 you're probably in a subpar annuity, mm -hmm. but, uh, but so you at least have some flexibility there. And an indexed annuity is what it is. It goes up with the index, a portion of the index. It doesn't go down when the stock market goes down. Or Most, whatever index is tracking. Yeah. yeah whatever index is correct. So that's going to be much more of a, of a smaller subset of people, which is funny because variable annuity sales declined 8% year over year uh, in the first quarter. 8% is a big drop. But indexed annuities, which we just said are more of a niche product, we agreed, went down 13%. Meaning, I think, I can infer, that more people were using indexed annuities inappropriately than were using variable annuities inappropriately. Maybe I'm wrong, and I know that's a little speculation there, but it, it's, it's just funny to me that the more niche product is off bigger than the less niche. Well, I think some of it has to do with the fact that it also is a path of least resistance, right? It's a really cute story to sell. It takes very little licensing to sell, right? So you don't have to go through all the same tests and requirements and, and compliance background that you have to with a variable annuity to sell an index annuity. They're, they're uh, much less regulated. And so you've got many more people that can use them inappropriately. And it pays a lot. So to yeah. the advisor. <laughs> yeah, to the advisor. Yeah, we're not talking about to clients the salesman. Here. <laughs> Let's not call him an advisor, right? <laughs> the yeah. sales guy. Yeah, we're not talking about like, the, the end user pays. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, it tells you everything you need to know there. It says one bright spot for insurers in Q1 was structured annuities, also known as buffer annuities, a sort of hybrid between indexed and variable products. I know nothing about structured annuities. It's first time I've ever heard of the phrase. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to. Uh, but do, this is this is a great thing. example, though, of the fact that new stuff comes out all the time. And it's always know? and it's funny in the insurance industry. It's usually a reaction, right? Yeah. It's a reaction. OK, we cut off this. So now we're going to do this. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I look at uh, I look at whole life was a solution that was meant to 
work so that people could uh, put money in early in in the life of a life insurance product, and then later on they wouldn't have to pay. And somebody got the great idea of saying, "Man, that the interest rate we're paying on this." That's a decent interest rate. We should use this as a savings account. Eh, probably not a great idea, but next thing you know, people are using life insurance as a savings account. And then with the rise of mutual funds and all of a sudden people are like, well, I don't want to save into a whole life policy. I'd rather save into, into something more flexible. Well, actually, even before that, when interest rates started going sky high, right, universal policies came out, which could react much more quickly to changes in interest rates over time. And then mutual funds got hot. So variable universal life policies came out. You just, you see the life insurance industry always go, oh, we've got that. Oh, we've got one of those. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can help with that. Yeah. It's funny to see. So we got to learn more about these structured annuities. Coming to a salesperson's desk near you. And in our second headline, Investopedia back in the news, they recently finished their market madness investing competition getting crazy over there again on Investopedia. And let's see what we can glean from this that we have on the line on my dad's shortwave, the CEO of Investopedia. Back for more, David Siegel. Welcome back, man. Great to be back. It was definitely a market madness to uh, always remember. You're, well, I want to know, what can we learn from this market madness competition that you guys uh, put on? Absolutely. So we had over 5,000 participants compete for about a four-month time period. They were all college students representing over a thousand different colleges uh, and universities across the U.S. where we gave out about $15,000. So I'll probably share three main learnings. Number one is Warren Buffett has always said, never buy a stock that you don't actually understand what it's doing. And one of the things that were fascinating that we found was just the absolute over-indexing of the traditional FANG stocks, the Amazons, Facebooks, Google, Netflix. People tend to buy what they know and what they're familiar with. And that's not any different when it comes to college students. Was so, that a key to success, though, David, in this competition? Was that a successful strategy, or in this competition, did it hurt them? Good question. It was a successful strategy to have a strong-performing portfolio, but it was not the successful strategy that ultimately the final winners ended up employing. The top winners focused on how can they take their $50,000 of virtual cash and turn it into $500,000 of virtual cash, meaning how can they potentially employ leverage in order to get more quote-unquote bang for the buck. So many of them employed options trading strategies, which allow a investor to potentially have outsized returns by only buying $1, $2, $3 type put, put options or call options. And, and ultimately it allowed them to get outsized returns because they were able to get more, do their dollars were able to go further. That's probably a strategy, though, that's better for a competition like this than with your whole 401k. That is definitely right. I think when dealing with one's 401k, you have to be understanding of risk and reward. In this type of a competition, um, risk was a little bit less of a factor, and reward was really what was ultimately the most rewarded. What was also interesting, however, was that Snapchat, which one would think millennials would be incredibly excited about because... Frankly, every millennial is using Snapchat. Of course, I don't use it since I'm too old. <laughs> and when I came onto Snapchat, they said to me, sorry, you were born in 1974. You can't use it. And it was actually one of the most shorted stocks by millennials, which is interesting because of the fact that after its IPO, it has had quite a few challenges. And, and maybe some of the college students who are their real users knew perhaps more than what other people use. And in fact, both all three of the top finalists ended up shorting Snapchat, ended up doing quite a bit better because of that Snapchat short. So that was an interesting learning that truly helped them in the competition. Wow. And I'm not surprised. I mean, we've been pretty negative about Snapchat here also, but I was surprised that when it came to two other big stocks, Apple and Tesla, students didn't always agree. Yeah, I think we all, we all tend to think that younger college students are so bullish on self-driving cars, and obviously they all use Apple. They're surrounded by Apple. In fact, they encase their entire bodies basically in Apple products. It was interesting to note how many thought that those stocks are likely overvalued. Tesla is a perfect example where you can't use really typical fundamental trading analysis to evaluate the value of, of Tesla stock. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of students said, hmm, there's a lot of hype here. It's gone up a lot, obviously, recently, but they didn't have confidence that it would continue. And the case of Tesla actually is down from the earlier days of the competition. Apple, however, you know, is up, but there was 
a mixed bag, shall we say, in both of those two stocks. Whereas for Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix, there was, by and large, much more on the long side than the short side. You know, this was using your Investopedia stock simulator, David. Who is that best geared for? Who do you think really needs the stock simulator, a beginner just trying to get their feet wet? Absolutely. So if you are interested in not just doing the traditional long approach to just buying stocks that you think are going to do well, I think that the stock simulators, one of the best uses for it is using it to trade options for the first time, using it to short sell for the first time. I don't know about you, but the first time that I started short selling, I was pretty much terrified. The first time that I traded <laughs> options, I was also terrified. Because the stock simulator wasn't around back in those long ago days, I just did it with real money. And frankly, the first time I did it, I lost a whole bunch of money because I didn't appreciate how to short sell or how to, how to trade options. The ability for students or anyone to trade options and not have the risk of losing real money is of significant value, the same as short selling. So as one gets more into different sophistication levels of trading, I think the need to not use real money but to trade with um, virtual currency has significant value. Uh, how much does it cost to use the Investopedia Stock Simulator? Just like everything else on Investopedia, it is free. So we have about 100,000 people a month that are using our stock simulator, and it's, it's all free. We just want to advance education, advance literacy, help people become better investors and traders. And it's a good way to test out the market without having to lose, you know, one shirt. David, free is my favorite price. So th <laughs> thanks for hanging out with <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. Absolutely. Great talking to you as always, Joe. Big thanks to David for coming on board. Isn't it funny that these uh, college students don't like Snapchat with their money? Not shocking, but maybe the college kids are even smarter than we get. Don't get me wrong. I think college kids are smart. But in terms of smart, seasoned investors that probably wouldn't go near Snapchat, the fact that college kids who use Snapchat won't go near it might tell you a little something. Tells there you too. everything you need to know about that. Yeah. So uh, lesson number one, thinking about investing in Snapchat mm, might uh, take a lesson from Investopedia and Mr. Siegel. And then uh, second lesson, thinking about an indexed or a variable annuity in your portfolio. Uh, sales are down. So, um, you know. Maybe you can get a better deal on one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they'll throw in some extra incentives. I'll give you a set of steak knives if you buy one now. Right. Maybe they're on but sale. wait, there's more. Yeah. Well, on Dad's shortwave is the man who is the executive producer of the new six-part documentary drama series on National Geographic, Year Million. It uh, premiered May 15th, but it's running right now. Oh, gee, you have seen David O'Connor's work in the past. Of course, we mentioned earlier on Tony Robbins, Not Your Guru, was his. Under the Influence, Keith Richards, you can also find on Netflix. He did Whitey. The United States of America versus James J. Bolger, the Whitey Bolger story for CNN Films and Magnolia Pictures, and also did Hank, Five Years from the Brink for Netflix and Bloomberg Business Week. He's also produced David Blaine, Real or Magic, primetime special for ABC, and the films Doc and Daryl and You Don't Know Bo for ESPN's Emmy and Peabody Award winning 30 for 30 series. He's done a ton of work. We're going to talk to him about money in the future on the new series Year Million. Let's say hello to David O'Connor. And on my dad shortwave, we have executive producer of this awesome miniseries, Year Million, Dave O'Connor. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Joe. This seems like a big change of pace for you. I mean, you've talked about Tony Robbins in the past. You've talked about Keith Richards. You've had many different things. What was it about this project that said, this is something I have to do now? Well, I've always been a, a big science fiction fan, and I love thinking about the future. I personally was introduced to some of these concepts in the show when I was a senior in high school, and I took a class called Discrete and Experimental Mathematics, which I took to get out of calculus, and it turned out to be life-changing, and it changed my understanding of the universe, of, of space and time, and what it meant. So it's always been just something since that moment on that I've been really interested in. We were lucky enough to work with National Geographic on a, on a show called Mars. We were talking about how humans were going to colonize Mars within the next 
25 years. As my colleague Justin Wilkes and I were were working on that, we we started thinking, well, like, wow, if if Mars is the near future, what kind of crazy stuff must be happening in the distant future? So the more we did some research on that, the deeper we got into it and the more exciting it got to us. Is it the, based on what you're talking about, science fiction meets reality, Dave, does that mean that there's a lot of quantum physics we're going to see in the show? It's not that we're going to like really weigh you down in the quantum <laughs> physics of it all, but certainly the ideas from quantum physics help us understand what the possibilities are for the future. One of the great things about quantum physics and theoretical physics is the people who spend a lot of time pondering these intense calculations and what what it means, usually during their time off, they're either reading science fiction or they're thinking about applying those ideas to the distant future. So a lot of these things that even people like me had never thought of before, they've thought a lot about. And when you ask them questions, they can talk for hours about <laughs> about the implications of it. So we had an enormous amount of, of material to call from just by tapping into these incredible thinkers and, and their minds. Obviously, Stacking Benjamins is a money show, and I'm curious how far you're able to dive into the role of money and commerce in the future. How are things going to change when it comes to economics? I think a lot of the big ideas about the economy in the future, if you start with something as simple as space travel and what Elon Musk and SpaceX are doing now, they've figured out how to launch rockets out of Earth's atmosphere, land them back on Earth, refurbish them and reuse them. And something that Elon says that always resonated with me is, you know, if you had to basically dump a jet into the ocean every time you flew from New York to Los Angeles, nobody would use jets to get from New York to Los Angeles. But we figured out how to reuse these jets for years and years and years, and that brings the cost of aeronautics way down. Similarly, in space travel, by reusing these rockets, we're going to bring down and fundamentally change the economics of space travel. I think from a resource standpoint, as we grow, our energy needs continue to grow. Our needs on this planet and scarcity that we face on this planet will continue to uh, confront us and eventually we're going to need to find resources elsewhere. And the economics of space exploration in terms of just, just simply harnessing the resources of our solar system and beyond is really interesting. Who owns this stuff? What if there are other life forms on these planets? What if there are other life forms there that have an ecosystem and we disrupt it? Even if they're not necessarily intelligent life forms, what responsibilities do we have in that, those instances? These are the kind of big economic driven questions that really will drive the deep future. And it's, it's interesting because not a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about it and we certainly don't have any answers yet. I'm looking at uh, Y Combinator now talking about basic income in Silicon Valley. I know you're probably a little familiar with that. And, and we look at the population growth and the type of stuff that you're looking at here in your million with technology and just the amazing stuff you're talking about. I mean, the idea when I was a kid that a rocket could be reused just blows me away or that we're even talking about Mars. More people on Earth, less for us to do because of technology. Does that mean basic income is going to be a bigger part of our future? What are people going to do in the future? Are we going to make we, documentaries? Yeah. <laughs> hey, if there's enough, uh, if there's enough <laughs> eyeballs to watch them all, then I'm all for it. I do think that the... You know, it's something we confront in the series, and we're seeing it already with artificial intelligence and jobs. You couple something along the ideas of you just look, look at our past to look at our future, right? And you go back to the Industrial Revolution. There has been no greater job upheaval and economic upheaval in the history of mankind than that until what we're on the cusp of facing today. And there's between advances in robotics, advances in artificial intelligence, a lot of jobs that we think of as uniquely human today, lawyers, doctors, uh, accountants, even, I hate to say it, documentary filmmakers are, are going to be losing those jobs because artificial intelligence will be able to do it just as well, if not better than we could. And I think there's a, there's a firewall that people believe exists between artificial intelligence and creative industries. What I'm seeing through the research I've done on this on this show 
is that firewall is not as strong as we once thought it was. And as soon as artificial intelligence has the ability to really create at a level beyond what humans are capable of, there will be no jobs that are safe. You couple that with this idea of radically expanding life expectancy. So now you have artificial intelligence and robotics that are taking most of the jobs away and creating lots of the stuff we need cheaply, efficiently, and well. And we now also, instead of living 80 years, have 160 years or 250 years to live. Those two things combined means we have a lot more spare time on our hands, a lot more to explore and figure out what to do. And the question of what money means in that era is something that is beyond my guessing abilities right now. I don't know how that world shapes. I think there's some people that feel maybe it will all just contribute to a further concentration of the rich get richer. And others think that it'll be the great equalizer, that money won't matter anymore and everybody will have exactly what they need whenever they need it. It's interesting to think about. I like to be an optimist. I like to think that it pushes us to explore more because, you know, as we're exploring different planets, there's things maybe that humans can do, you know, at, at first to set up the systems for technology to take over that, uh, you know, maybe that maybe pushes us out into the universe, Dave. That would be awesome. I think that's uh, that definitely necessary for the long term survival of the human race. Uh, we know that the the Earth has an expiration date. Our sun has an expiration date. And if we want humanity to evolve and survive into the deep, deep distant future beyond year million, we're going to have to get off this planet and we'll have to eventually get out of the solar system. So, yeah, I don't know that there's a more important thing for us to be thinking about and talking about than than these kinds of topics. I'd be remiss with the last couple of minutes I have you on the line here if I didn't ask you some questions about the making of the series, because I know for a filmmaker like yourself, it has to be just fascinating seeing kind of what unfolds in front of you. What was really surprising when you were making your million that you didn't expect going in? Well, one of the most surprising things for me was how deep the connection is between science fiction and the creation of new technology. And I think we all know a little bit about that and intuitively know a little bit about it, but really this give and take between the imaginations of people who work in science fiction to conjure potential technologies and the way they're used in the future. That is the stuff that inspires people to go into science and go into engineering. And then it inspires them to actually create these technologies for us today. So what I'm fascinated by is this, this give and take between those two worlds and, and just how deep it is. You debuted on Monday, May 15th. It's a six-part documentary drama series, and I have to tell you, it's, it's been gripping so far. I can't wait to see what, what you still have in store for us. Thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes, Dave. Thanks so much, Joe. Have a great afternoon. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. All right, trivia fans, here's a warning for all of you kids out there celebrating Memorial Day on a picnic with the family. If you're out with Joe's mom, Make sure you find out what's in the punch before taking a drink. Lesson learned there, but let's serve up some Memorial Day themed trivia. How about this? What was the original name for Memorial Day? I'll have your answer right after I find out if this thing OG handed me is really a turkey burger. Looking to shake up and pay down your personal and student loans? We'll partner with a company that's shaking up the business of lending. According to MagnifyMoney.com, SoFi is the leader in every area in which they compete, whether it's student loans, personal loans, some areas you wouldn't expect, like mortgages. Here's what Dan Macklin, co-founder of SoFi, had to say about how SoFi is shaking up the lending industry. Yeah, well, SoFi is a very different finance company uh, compared to the traditional guys out there. For example, we host happy hours and dinners all around the country. We've now hosted them in more than 35 states and we've had 8,000 people attend these. And people come along and sometimes I think they're gonna get a sales pitch, but they don't. It's just a chance for them to, to meet each other, to meet new friends and, and really great things happen from that. And we get to know our customers really well um, and, and people really enjoy the events. 
So when's the last time your bank called you up and said, hey, let's go to happy hour? Even better, SoFi is going to give you $100 when you get approved through our link, stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. You could use that to take us to happy hour. Isn't that a great idea? (laughs) Probably not. They're your number one choice of refinancing your loans. The next stop in your path to financial security is SoFi. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. I've talked about this stat before, but this is scary. According to a 2016 Gallup poll, 48% of all Americans don't own any stock. And I realize it can be daunting when it's time to start something new, but here's a great thing. Getting invested is more to do with taking baby steps than leaping headfirst into Wall Street. Here's Brian Barnes, founder of M1 Finance, on just how easy it is to be invested. So you just either log on to the website or use the mobile application. We're native on Android and iOS, and it takes about three minutes, and your first $1,000 that you deposit is managed for free. I'd love to say the free $1,000 is a special deal I made for you, but uh, Brian and M1 Finance are that good to everybody. With M1, you can select from one of dozens of professionally designed portfolio pies, or you can customize it, as mom says, to your heart's content. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash M1 Finance for more. That's stackybenjamins.com. M, the number one, finance.com for more. So just fire up their mobile app, M1 Finance, be invested. Hey, trivia fans, welcome back to Trivia and today's Memorial Day cookout. It turns out that Hamburger Helper stands up just fine on its own. I I think I've heard that somewhere before. (laughs) Hashtag yum. Okay, before the break, I asked you this question. What was today's holiday originally named before it became known as Memorial Day? The answer, Decoration Day. Why was it called that? Well, originally, today was celebrated by heading out to the cemetery and placing flowers, flags, and wreaths on the graves of soldiers. The holiday has grown over the years, and Congress voted on changing the name to Memorial Day in 1967. All right, now with trivia down, time for some friendly bingo with Joe's Mom's Bridge Club. See ya! Big thanks again to Dave O'Connor for uh, taking some time out of his schedule to visit with us today. You know, OG, this idea of not enough work for people to do, too many people, not enough stuff. I mean, it's funny when you've got a guy who's done this six-part series like Dave has, and he can't even think of what are we all going to do in the future? Well, I have quite a bit of faith and hope and optimism. So uh, while I can't predict what the future holds with any of that stuff, I it's kind of like you look at some of the stuff that people are doing nowadays and 20 years ago that, that, that work didn't even exist. Like a full-time podcast maker, <laughs> yeah. right? Part-time, double full-time for you. But no, I mean, some of the technologies, you know, I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day that, you know, what my kids end up being when they grow up hasn't even been invented yet. Yeah. So we can't even foreshadow what that looks like. Whereas, you know, 50 years ago, it was easy to say, I'll go work on the line at Ford like the old man did, you know. I also think it's interesting, this idea of moving off the planet, that that picks up steam. I I just find that exciting. I find the whole Mars thing exciting. I think that uh, humans living other places, pretty pretty cool. I guess we'll see. Good stuff. Hey, yeah, you all can leave and I'll have more of this (laughs) stuff to myself. I'll take the known outcome. Thank you very much. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they are disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on the two things you value most, your family and your time. That's why they've created a high quality, affordable term life insurance policy. You can purchase entirely online. That's the piece I like, OG. You can purchase it entirely online and qualified healthy applicants can even skip the medical exam. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and to learn about life insurance the modern way. If you haven't checked out getting a quote uh, through Haven Life, that process so absolutely incredibly easy. Yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah, I don't 10 think, minutes. I don't, think, minutes. I don't think we can put it more simply than that. Let's say hello to Jeff. We're throwing out the Haven Lifeline to Jeff today. Say hi, Jeff. Hey, Joe and OG. This is Jeff from South Jersey first time caller. I've sent mail to the basement before, which has been answered. So I appreciate that. Hey, today I'm calling about a recent 
book recommendation that OG said on the show, which was Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth by Nick Murray. He had mentioned this book on the show a few years back, and uh, I had picked up a copy and I, I finished it within the past six months. And let me tell you something. That book was incredible. That book needs to be a, a mandatory read for every freshman in, in high school and every freshman in college. It's that important. It's funny because after reading that book, a lot of the answers that you guys give on the show tie right back into that book. So that book, definitely, I can see how it's the foundation for a lot of the things you guys do. And it's fantastic. OG, incredible recommendation. Thank you so much. Related to that, uh, I do have a question. In the book, he talks about the five different types of funds that he would, in, you know, that you would set up your uh, portfolio around. And just a question: Would an S and P five hundred fund count as both the large cap growth and value? Since he breaks those both out, just wondering if you would consider the S and P to cover both of those. That's currently how I have it set up, but just wanted to get your take. Thanks, guys. Sweet. Something actually worked out. I said the thing and the thing worked. You don't think OG actually read that book, do you? Gosh, I've got probably about six of them sitting on my shelf. It's a great book. I love that book. I don't know what you think of it, Joe, but uh, I I think it's a great starter book. I want to get back to the book in a second because I think we should go right to his question and then we'll let's talk about the book after that. Sure. Uh, the answer is sure. No problem there. S&P 500, I think, generally is considered a large cap blend, which is uh, smack dab in the middle of growth and value. I think you'll find it has more characteristics of large cap growth. So if you can split those two up and have a uh, Russell 1000 growth and a Russell 1000 value fund, I think you pick up a little bit of uh, extra value premium there, the benefits of having value than having the one S&P, but it's marginal at best, right? It's it's nickel and dime stuff, icing on the cake. So S&P 500, happy to consider that a little bit of both. So Nick Murray's book, Nick Murray, an amazing human being. I've seen him speak twice. Uh, Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. What is it about that book you think that really resonates with people? The biggest thing for me is that it's written in very normal language, And it goes through the factual historical evidence of the stock market and what you can really expect. After you read it and you understand it, it takes a lot of the oomph out of market declines, right? And very reasonably puts in place some of the tenets that I personally believe, which are, why would you have fixed income in a portfolio? It's only going to grow barely past inflation, you know, contrasted to large and small cap stocks. And and once you see that kind of written out and saying, okay, here's all the different bear markets that have happened. Here's the peak to trough decline. Here's how long it takes to recover. All that sort of stuff. I think I think it takes a little of the, the sting out of what might happen in the future and gives you confidence to continue investing according to your plan. That's what I really like is how he dispels a lot of the hot stock myths, you know. A lot of the stuff that people focus on that's irrelevant, right? Yeah. He just takes away all the baloney, a lot of which you get in the popular press, which is why we like talking about popular press articles here. So we can kind of go through, yeah, this is the wheat. This is the chaff, you know, yeah, this stuff you got to know. Great. Thanks for the call, Jeff. Thanks for the endorsement of uh, that book. By the way, if you buy books and you want to help the show, if for some reason you can't use our sponsors links to help that way, Use these are Amazon links, stackofbenjamins.com forward slash Amazon takes you right to Amazon. And if you buy the book that way, then uh, that also helps support the show. I didn't want that to be a commercial, but I think a lot of new listeners don't know that we even have that link. Sure. We also get letters. Doug just brought down the mail and we've got a letter from Becky. Becky says she's new to the fire movement. And OG, the fire movement is a fairly recent term, I think. People have been using that for a long time. It's financial independence, retire early. People trying to save as much money as they can to retire as quickly as they can. We had Jeremy on from Go Curry Cracker, who is very young. Uh, If you remember, he sold almost all of his possessions, worked his butt off as an engineer, and now lives in Asia and just does whatever the heck he wants to, doesn't need the income anymore. You can go back and listen to... uh, Just go to the website and look up Go Curry Cracker and you'll find Jeremy's interview as a recent guest who's part of the FIRE movement. But anyway, Becky says she's new to the FIRE movement, but had been saving a large percentage of her income for the past year. She just now has started to take personal control of her investing and has learned a great deal the past few months from us and other podcasters and bloggers. She learned from us 
What's that all about? It must be a mistake. Yeah, that's that's a typo. She loves the idea of investing in low-cost index funds. The problem she has is there are only a few available in her 401k. She does have the Fidelity S&P 500 index, but there are no bond market or global index funds. There's one global and two bond options with higher expense ratios. They do not look exactly like what I want. I also have a Roth IRA, which I recently moved to Vanguard, so possibilities are endless there. Would it be an acceptable workaround to invest my entire Vanguard Roth IRA in a bond market index fund and then invest my entire 401k in stock index funds like 80% S&P 500 and 20% Russell 2000? I agree with some of the big names that an international fund isn't completely necessary, although I may add 20% international in my portfolio if it were an option available to me. If I total the dollars I have in both accounts, that would leave me with about 15% bonds and 85% stocks which is the allocation I'm looking for. Although, is it okay to split between 401k and Roth in this way? Am I missing something? Great question, Becky. What do you say, OG? Hmm. I say like 50% of what she's trying to do is right. Here's what I would want to focus on. I like the idea of asset allocation across the household, right? Where you say, I've got really good options here with this and I've got great options over here with that. So I'm going to use the, all the good options to the best of their ability, so to speak. And over my household, I've got my allocation that I want. The comment about international not mattering, I think is is not true. It does have some correlation to, to the U.S. market, but but I think that from a diversification standpoint, you want to have it. You know, my opinion on fixed income, which is that I don't think you need it at all, especially as you're accumulating money in your portfolio. The problem that I have with what she just mentioned is it kind of takes the wind out of the sails of your Roth IRA by using a fixed income fund or bond fund in there. So generally speaking, bond funds are not going to grow as much as a stock or a small cap or international U.S. Uh, stock or international fund would grow historically, right? And so the whole purpose of a Roth IRA is to have tax-free money for the rest of your life. So if that's the case, I would want the highest grower to be there in that account because that's going to has the potential anyway to grow the most right whereas in my 401k where where i'm gonna have to pay taxes on that or my regular brokerage account that's where i would want to have either the the more stable growth thing if you want to use a fixed income fund or or the dividend payers so i would kind of turn that around just a little bit and i would say if you're if you're sure that you want to have a fixed income fund in your portfolio as a whole i would put it in the 401k versus the roth if those are my two options, even if it's not exactly an index fund, so be it, right? The allocation is the thing that matters the most. 90% of your results are based on asset allocation. The other 10% are timing, stock selection, and cost. So yeah, you want to go with the lowest cost option, but you want to go with the lowest cost option in the context of your overall asset allocation first. Yeah. Man, how many times have you seen somebody that has the best Japan fund and they don't need a Japan fund? I'm just throwing something. You know what I mean? Yeah. They got the best one. They got the lowest cost and it is so... they Perfectly could, wrong for them. Yeah. They could have had the best European international growth fund, which was perfect for them, but had a much higher expense ratio, fit the bill way better for their portfolio. And it would have been a better option, even though it was higher fees than the wrong fund in the wrong asset class. I totally get yeah. what you're talking about so, there. So go with solve for asset allocation first and then fill in with the products afterward. And then, and I like the idea of, you know, cross populating that throughout your entire household's investment account, but you want to be sure that you're putting the right thing in the right place. I don't like a fixed income fund in the Roth if I can help it. Well, no. And the other thing that I think about too, is that sometimes people use that Roth IRA a little more flexibly so they'll use it uh, before retirement. And if you're, and if you're, uh, I don't know, you just, I like starting with the goal and making sure that all that money is going to be used for the goal first. But I do like, here's what I do like that she's doing. And you mentioned this offhand. I really like taking the whole pie instead of a piece of the pie, right? So as an example, if somebody has a 401k like Becky does, and let's say she has a traditional IRA, I don't like perfectly allocating the 401k and then perfectly allocating the traditional IRA. I do like if it's all for one goal, putting those all together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Because like she said, you know, a lot of 401ks have some great funds in a certain area and are deficient in others, but I'm, I'm totally with you with the tax treatment being different on these. Not as, not as great. 
Good a lot stuff. of layers to this solution here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great question, Becky. Congratulations on on saving a lot of your money. And I know that for a lot of people on that fire movement, that that's that's an exciting thing for them looking at that early finish line, OG, or early starting line, as it were, right? Early starting line for the rest of your life and doing what the hell you want instead you of go. what the man wants, right? If you have a question you'd like us to throw up Haven Lifeline for you, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That's stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. You can also write us a letter. To give you an idea, though, Becky wrote this question to us back in March, and the Haven Lifeline call from Jeff happened just over a week ago. So you want to get your question answered quickly, head to the Haven Lifeline, stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you've got really heavy questions, and you know what? You know that you need professional help in your corner. Well, guess what? OG's taking clients, and the way to get on his calendar to talk about what it would take to have him work with you is stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. I always feel like air traffic control at this part. If you want to do this, go through this door. <laughs> yeah, turn this door. Do this, do yeah, this. Yes. turn this way. If you hey, don't want to do any of these things, hit delete. <laughs> I don't know which I don't know which airplane episode it was, but I think it was airplane three where they're actually going on, I think it was a space shuttle or something. I, I don't remember, but but there was a there was an information booth and people were coming up to the information booth. Where's the flight to Los Angeles take off? Over here. Uh, where's the flight to Chicago? Oh, it's uh, gate B7. Go through this. And then the next person comes up and says, what's the capital of Vermont? Montpelier. Then the next person comes up and says, 100 pound dog, a big dog? Depends on the breed. And so- uh, <laughs> I don't remember that at all. I think we stick a fork in this one, though, OG. Uh, big thanks to Dave O'Connor for coming. If you want to see your million, uh, that's on uh, National Geographic. And uh, I think talking to Dave, it might come to Netflix. But I think if you want to catch uh, the last few episodes here, check out where that's showing on the National Geographic channel. All right. We're back Wednesday with Dr. Amir Balouk. And uh, uh, Dr. Baluk is an anesthesiologist, but he also has a real estate company. He wrote this book, Make It, Keep It, which is the new rules of wealth preservation for doctors. And initially I said, well, our show is way wider than doctors. And then I read this and about the things he thinks are important for doctors to know. And you know what's funny, OG? They're the stuff that's important for all of us to know. If it's important for a doctor to know, what's important that the rest of us also need to know? And uh, Dr. Amir Balouk coming down to the basement on uh, Wednesday. Fascinating. I talked to him uh, extensively about this uh, because I just wasn't sure. I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't think this is. And man, is he he's a he's a cool guy. And so all right. we're going to have cool some guy coming down range. Basement like on it. Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, I'll go stack some Benjamins. Bye bye. So what did we learn today? First, I think we can all take a lesson from David Siegel from Investopedia. Invest in what you know, but also do your homework first. Even though Snapchat might be a fun tool to snap with Joe's mom, the investment opportunities, if the collective is right, could be limited. Second, annuities? While an annuity can be an effective retirement planning option, they're way overused. If someone tells you to buy an annuity, carefully weigh why you're being told to make the purchase. Is it to help you or so someone can make a big fat commission? But the big lesson? Don't play what they call a, quote, friendly game of Memorial Day bingo with Joe's mom's bridge club. Who ever heard of strip bingo? Is that even a thing? Hey, old lady, get back here with my pants. A big thank you to Dave O'Connor for stopping by. Watch Year Million on the National Geographic channel. We'll have a link to days and times on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to David Siegel from Investopedia. Hey, what's with all the Davids today? Hey, you'll find out more about their stock market simulator at investopedia.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and well, if you haven't figured that out by now, you're just not paying attention. 
SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. For those of you in the USA, I hope you're having a safe and thoughtful Memorial Day. Everyone else, we hope you're just having a fantastic Monday. With pants, of course. No, I'm telling you, I quit. No more bingo until you tell me where my socks went now. Damn it! I'm telling you, these old vixens are incorrigible. Welcome to the after show. Those of you new to the show, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. If you are new here, I'll tell you the rules. You don't, we don't talk. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. We've had some people violate that before. Please follow the rules, people. If follow you, the rules. If, if you, we will kick you out of the club. <laughs> we've asked nicely, and then we ask people to just call it. If you got to call it anything, call it dessert. If you call it dessert, then that's fine. Then uh, the nice secret code word. the secret stays. But we don't talk about money usually. So if you want to continue the money discussion, just go back and download some of the episodes that you haven't heard yet. Like five hundred of them. Yeah, so go, go back. Don't and start at one. They kind of suck at the beginning. Yeah. Start around ten or fifteen. Don't go back and, or go back and listen to those. But you're never going to find in the after show what you're looking for if it is money related. Instead, we talk about movies a lot lately because OG finally is back to watching some films, which is good to see. And uh, this is a movie you just saw on video. Uh, yeah, traveling for uh, my after school activity, a little hobby, and uh, found myself in a hotel room that had Showtime. Ah, uh, this is from 2007. Stars Kevin Costner. And it's called Mr. Brooks. <laughs> Grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Portland Chamber of Commerce Man of the Year, Mr. Earl Brooks. I never dreamed that I would one day be standing here. Hello, gorgeous. Hey, Daddy. I think you should go back to school. You didn't even go to college and you're successful. You've been a good boy for a long time. You know you want to do this. Hello. No visible signs of forced entry. We even had to cut the security chains to get in. If I didn't know better, I'd say these people... But that got dark in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> that escalated quickly, huh? <laughs> Holy cow. He's this <laughs> nice guy, and all of a sudden, he's uh, killing people. Yeah. So, Mr. Brooks, he has a, uh alter ego where he is a uh, mass murderer. There's a lot of different twists and turns in this movie, but it was an interesting, interesting journey. So, so basically, he's, uh, you know, outward appearances, very successful. Wife, kid... Everybody's happy. He's a man of the year. Got a great business. And his side hobby is uh, randomly killing people. They don't do anything to offend him. He just picks them out of a hat, basically. And then something happens. Unfortunately, he kind of gets caught, but he doesn't get caught. And so now he's got to figure a way out of being caught. And then this other stuff happens with the family. It's a nice thriller. I don't like a lot of the like the Saw movies and that sort of that stuff's over the top for me. This is uh, last week, Wednesday, we talked about a um, courtroom drama. This is like a courtroom drama, only not the court part. This is all the 
this is the thriller that happens before court. So your movies, the first half of Law and Order, mine's the second half. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it really could be. So sometimes when I travel, you know, you, you, you don't you don't know what's on TV, so you just kind of flip it on, and all of a sudden you get kind of caught, and you're like, oh, Kevin Costner, right? He's not dancing with wolves, so I probably haven't seen it. And so you kind of start watching for a little bit, and all of a sudden it's like, dang, I'm an hour into this thing, and I'm still watching it. So I guess it's pretty, pretty interesting. So yeah, it looks so good. Definitely a thumbs up. Great popcorn movie. I, I mean, shoot, it sounds like it's been out for ten years. I didn't realize. How about that? He says 2007. I was like, oh, geez. So it was a real, really old movie then, technically. But uh, on Showtime right now, and probably on uh, Netflix and Hulu and all the other places as well. But. Uh, they got a middling Rotten Tomato score of 60 or something, which isn't terribly great, but uh, it was pretty good. Nice. So go watch it, everybody. Yeah, thumbs up. All right. Grab a hot dog and a, and a brewski for Memorial Day and go watch a thriller about the your about, next door neighbor just arbitrarily whacking people. About, yeah. <laughs> what a great way to end your Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> All right, everybody. Go stack some Benjamins.